Thank you for that kind introduction. It's, uh, it's very, uh, very lovely. It's nice to be in Bridgewater today. Uh, I live in, as you heard, Meriden Village. Uh, it's part of the town of Plainfield. Now, when I travel around New Hampshire, I always ask, how many have ever heard of Plainfield, New Hampshire? Show of hands, right here. Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> I was way over in Carroll County last fall, over on the main border, and there was a group, well, probably twice the size of this. One hand went up, and that fellow was from Parsonsfield, Maine. So the Plainfield is not very well known beyond the valley here. Um, anyway, uh, I'm uh, uh, happy to be in Bridgewater. Now, I know there's a Bridgewater, Mass., there's a Bridgewater, Vermont, and there's a Bridgewater, New Hampshire. Now, I'm not sure about Maine, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Connecticut. 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 Okay, so you got four out of six. Do you know which town name is present in all six New England states? There's one town. Warren. That man, give him the prize over there. That's good. Well, as you heard, I've, uh, I've been, uh, I was commissioner of agriculture for a long time. And uh, I have to explain this thing about independent scholar. Oh, God. Uh, anyway, uh, when I retired, I had been working back on the farm with my boys for a couple of years. And, a gentleman from the Humanities Council called up and said, you know, we have a stable of speakers that travels around uh, and does presentations for historical societies and libraries and all kinds of groups. And uh, we're a little thin on the subject of rural history, agriculture. Do you suppose you could do a talk about that for us? And I said, well, I think so. And they said, fine. We'll send you some paperwork that you've got to fill out, and then you'll have to have an audition. Okay, well, the paperwork came, and I sat down and started filling it out, and I got to the line that said, what is your terminal degree? I said, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, obviously, they're looking for a PhD, or at least a master's. I barely got my bachelor's degree, so I laid it aside. Clearly, I realized I wasn't qualified. Uh, and so a couple of weeks went by, and the man called back, and he said, where's the paperwork? Got to have it right off. I said, geez, I'm not qualified for your program. He said, what do you mean? Uh, I said, I, I don't have a PhD. I don't have a master's. Ah, he said, we'll call you an independent scholar. 
uh, so uh, around the farm, anytime I foul something up, my boys will say, independent scholar, you know. So <laughs> that. So I, I started in doing a kind of barnstorming around New Hampshire, and I've come into Vermont, I've gone into Maine and Massachusetts uh, with a, a, several different talks. First one I did was about the great sheep boom and its enduring legacy on the landscape, right here in Bridgewater is a perfect example. Any place you've got stone walls, you had sheep in the early half of the 19th century. The only time in New England history when people got rich farming. And uh, really the genesis of the Grange in New Hampshire and Vermont kind of traces to that, the end of the demise of that period of prosperity, and I'll speak about that in a moment. And I've done talks about how cows have nurtured us for 400 years here in New England, and uh, I'll talk about the one-room school, and uh, you know, a bunch of different topics. Lately I've been doing one about the uh, decisions that were made in Concord and Montpelier about where roads would go during the great interstate highway boom and uh, uh, how it's played out for towns, for better or for worse, around these two states. And of course the, the classic case is Interstate 89. You know, Claremont and Rutland wanted it to go south of Mount Sunapee over to Rutland and up the west side of Vermont and New London and Lebanon and White River, uh, they wanted to come up through Montpelier and on to Burlington. Well, we know how that played out, but look at the results now. I mean, go to Claremont, the place is flat on its back, and you've got all kinds of prosperity, Lebanon, White River Junction, you know, Hanover. I mean, they're, they're just uh, booming all the time. So it's a, it's a fun story. But this one here is, is part of all the talks I do is the one that to me is really the most interesting because of the alignment of the Grange with progressive causes at the beginning of the 20th century. Very profound in New Hampshire, very profound in Vermont. The influence of the Grange. But uh, sort of to kick it off, we really need to start, crank it back to how this organization got going as a national movement. We go back to, well, first of all, what's, what's this with Grange? What is that about? What, where does that come from? Well, it traces to the Latin word for granary, and uh, uh, far back as Geoffrey Chaucer, we see reference to grange. And in the British Isles and Ireland, often they'll call a large agricultural enterprise a grange. Even today, Alexander's Hamil Alexander Hamilton spread in New York. He called it a grange. And, uh, but uh, the founder of the Grange Movement, this character named Oliver Hudson Kelly, he kind of liked the term, he plucked it out of thin air. It was, a title, it, it was included in the title of a popular novel at the time, and he said, well, I'll call this movement for short, Grange. But the real name of the movement is the Order of the Patrons of Husbandry. Well, you can see why they, they wanted a, you know, a quick term. Um, so anyway, uh, it's an interesting uh, organization. It is a secret order. Uh, it is uh, uh, organized on four levels. There's a national grange, and in each state there's a state grange. And under each state grange are what you really call county level organizations. They call them Pomonas. And then at the grassroots, what they call a subordinate grange, this building would have been a subordinate grange. It's a local grange. So wherever you go in the United States where the grange is active, the structure is the same. And if you went to a grange meeting in Bridgewater and then you went to Washington State, it would be very, very similar because they have a very structured meeting uh, uh, protocol. Uh, they all begin with, of course, a prayer and a salute to the flag. Uh, and then the opening of the Bible, which occupies a central spot, and I'm sure we'll see upstairs, and then a business meeting, and then entertainment or educational activity, and then a closing ceremony. Now, the Grange, as a secret order, drew its ritual from the Masonic Rite, which traces way back to Scotland in the 15th, 16th century. So if you're a, a Mason, and you go to a Grange meeting, you're pretty much right at home. Uh, all the Grangers did was take the Masonic Rite and throw in terms, uh, 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 provisions of 
soil and fertility and husbandry, the land, the crops, and those kinds of things to flesh it out and give it focus. So the Grange, being a secret organization, has secret ritual. It has degrees, passwords, handshakes, these kinds of things that uh, are very, very uh, central to its order. If you, you know, uh, you, you're trying to grasp this concept, think of the elks or the moose, all of these orders that sprang up in the 19th century all uh, put a great deal of emphasis on their, their secret ritual uh, and, and, um, and rites and degrees and so on. Uh, the, uh, the, the Grange's goal from the outset was to teach lessons of brotherhood, duty to God, morality, and the importance of hard work. And the motto has always been faith, hope, charity, and fidelity. Very simple. Um, Oliver Hudson Kelly. Um, he, today we would call him an operator. He was a politician, an investor, a farmer from Minnesota. And uh, from all that I can learn about him was uh, he had a wife that did most of the work on the farm while he gallivanted around politicking and, uh, and uh, making a name for himself. Well, in 1866, uh, President Johnson called on Oliver Hudson Kelly to go to the former states of the Confederacy and do an assessment of the state of agriculture and food production. Now, that's quite an assignment. You know, they hated Yankees, and, they, you know, a year and a half earlier, they'd been killing them. And so Hudson went, Kelly went down there and, and did the job. He looked around, he, he wrote up reports, brought them to the White House, and some of his recommendations actually made it into legislation during the Reconstruction period. But while he was doing this, he came up with this idea. He saw a need for a society of farmers. And he was very insistent that it be a secret order, that the farmers could gather and practice a ritual that that would bind them together. And so this was his dream and his idea. But as he was pulling it together over the next year or two, he had a niece that convinced him that this new order that he was putting together needed to have women members as full equals with women having the privilege of serving in any officer. Now that's radical. You think about it. That's 60 years ahead of universal suffrage. And when even the idea of suffrage was, was hardly even on the radar. Uh, but here, this, this niece said, women. And I will argue today that the influence of women had a very profound, the, the presence of women had a very profound effect on the political positions that the Grange movement would take, the concern for the welfare of children, for improving education, better health, highways, reforms, all sorts of reforms. I say many of them were driven by the feelings of women. So uh, put that down, please. Um, so anyway, uh, he started out with eight disciples, and one of them was a character named John R. Thompson, and he's from New Hampshire, and you can go up to Littleton in the field up there. There's a big boulder with a, uh, a marker on it uh, memorializing his contributions to the organization of the Grange. And he happened to marry a Vermont girl from St. Johnsbury. And after the New Hampshire Grange was up and running, he came over and helped organize the, the Grange movement uh, in, in Vermont. Uh, anyway, the first meeting at the national level was in 1867. Now bear in mind this is primarily an upper Midwest organization at the outset because that's where Kelly was from. Uh, it never really took root in the south, uh, but in the north and across the northern parts of the United States it, it really got going. Well, look at how uh, the country was changing post-Civil War. Uh, uh, there were a whole bunch of forces like loose. Uh, and the biggest was the railroads. The railroads opening uh, land to the west. You know, first the Ohio and the Indiana and Illinois country and then spreading further and further. Uh, but the railroads uh, tended to be rapacious, uh, 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 gouging the farmers on rates. And so early on, the Grange, right off the bat, went to war with the railroads trying to get them uh, brought to heel, uh, 
pleading with legislatures and leading in several states to the adoption of what were called Granger laws, which were really forerunners of antitrust laws that would come in the beginning of the 20th century at the national level. So the Grange was very much uh, a political organization from the get-go. But the Grange was sort of functioning on three tracks. The political, as I just said, and then uh, sort of the economic. Uh, they got into cooperative buying and marketing. Uh, farmers needed a way to pull their crops together in a large aggregation and uh, get a better price. And similarly for inputs for agricultural fertilizers, seed, uh, grain, those kinds of things that they needed to, to produce uh, if you, you got a large number of people together uh, to, uh, to, to uh, seek, you know, to, to go to market and try to get a better price. That was a Grange goal. And then the, probably the third and most important in terms of building this, this order to get the numbers was the social dimension. You think of rural America in 1868 or so, no television, no newspapers, no te uh, re uh, telephones, uh, might see a newspaper once a month. Uh, you know, it was desolate life. But here was an organization that offered uh, a, a little fellowship, get people together every couple of weeks for a meeting, people in similar circumstances. Particularly important in New Hampshire and Vermont. New Hampshire and Vermont, post-Civil War, were beset by a period of melancholy, of grieving, heavy losses in the Civil War, and then the exodus of population. Population in Bridgewater, in Plainfield, and all these rural towns hemorrhaged. People packed up and left, and there was just grieving about that. You imagine land cleared at enormous toil, reverting to forest. People grieved about that. We still do, many of us. But anyway, uh, as an example, my town of Plainfield, New Hampshire, right uh, as the crow flies from here about 12 miles, just on the other side of the river from Heartland, lost 30% of its population and 40% of its tax base between 1860 and 1890. I mean, it was a horrible shock. I mean, it was just a wipeout, really. And there were towns in Sullivan County over in my country that had 1,800 people at the time of the Civil War by 1920 had 200 people. I mean, just cleaned up. People went to, to Oregon or California or Wisconsin, wherever, to farm, or they went to work in the great mills in the Merrimack Valley or, or down country. So uh, this idea of a social dimension was a big deal. And uh, that was what fed the Grange and got it rolling. Um, that hunger for social connection is, is so important. And uh, we did an oral history in Plainfield back in the 1970s. And one of the people that I interviewed was a man who was then in his 90s. So he could recall the 1890s. And he went to, to Grange meeting. And I said, Uncle Ralph, what happened to the Grange meeting that you would even go? And he said, not much of anything, a little bit of everything. You know? Well, they might play cards. Or somebody play the piano. Or they sing, somebody read poetry, somebody uh, do, read an essay, do those kinds of things. You know, absolutely the most simple things. But they had great value and meaning to people, and they just loved it. And so that's what it was. Uncle Ralph also told wonderful stories about going to town meeting in Plainfield in the 1890s. He told about they had sawdust on the floor, of course, just men. Sawdust on the floor, they had oysters on offer. And they dispensed shots of whiskey from the back of the hall. He said they started at 10 o'clock. By noontime, he says, like a bunch of young bulls, they want to knock each other down. How about that? Well, ladies of the Grange, I'm sure, uh, are pretty appalled by that kind of activity. Uh, so anyway, that, that, that is just so important. Whether we're talking about New Hampshire or Maine or Vermont or wherever, uh, that social dimension is just a powerful, powerful piece of how that Grange movement just got rolling. And so we'll turn out of Vermont um, and talk specifically here. Um, I did a lot of research for the Woodstock Historical Society. They were on a tear about four years ago about the Grange movement. They're very, very interested. So I spent a lot of time doing it, and it, it all meshes with what happened in New Hampshire. So it's fine. I'm, I'm happy to have done it. 
Um, anyway, uh, the uh, uh, gentleman up in St. John's, by name Jonathan Lawrence, wrote a letter to Oliver Hudson Kelly. Well, he'd heard about this Grange thing getting going, uh, and he wrote a letter to Mr. Kelly out in Minnesota, uh, and it is dated July 1st of 1870. He, uh, Mr. Lawrence, was the president of the Caledonia County Farmers Club. And uh, he, uh, he communicated to Mr. Kelly, uh, how about uh, taking a look at the um, Grange movement coming to, to, um, to uh, Vermont? What can you do? Well, uh, Kelly wrote right back. He said, I'm going to make you de my deputy to organize the Grange in Vermont. And uh, this was the first deputy in New England. See, he already had John Thompson covering New Hampshire. Uh, so in 1871, on the 4th of July, there were 15 people up in Caledonia County who signed a charter, uh, and Mr. Kelly was on hand to witness it. So that was the formal start of the Grange Movement in Vermont. Um, uh, so Kelly spent some time here, and John Thompson he came over from Littleton and helped uh, um, go around and, 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 and sell this concept. So a year later, on, on the 4th of July in 1872, the formation of the Vermont State Grange really uh, became formalized, and they had a big celebration. Now, Mr. Kelly was quite a ladies' man, and at this celebration, they were dancing, and he asked one of the ladies there to dance, and people were scandalized that he was even consider, you know, dancing with somebody else's wife. They were pretty upset, they were pretty uptight up there in St. Johnsbury. I didn't like that. But anyway, he, he, he got away with it, I guess. Uh, so in a year's time, 38 subordinate granges are formed in Vermont. I mean, this is just happening just like that. It's, it's amazing. Um, and the Vermont Grange, somewhat different from New Hampshire in the sense, this sense, that they focused a great deal on cooperative buying uh, early on. In other words, they, they saw that the farmers in Vermont needed to get better prices for their products, uh, they, uh, uh, and they needed to get uh, their inputs at, at better value. And so they, they, they went full, full bore into this, marketing of milk, apples, fruit, whatever, and purchasing of fertilizer and grain and other supplies, as well as household goods. And uh, it, uh, it uh, immediately provokes uh, a great deal of uh, anger amongst the merchant class. People saw his this secret organization, which they accused of humbuggery, uh, cooking up uh, deals to buy flour or sugar or, or fertilizer or whatever uh, for less uh, than these merchants were uh, accustomed to expecting to receive. And uh, the merchants uh, prevailed on a number of newspapers to um, editorialize against this Grange movement uh, getting rolling and uh, focusing on cooperative buying and marketing. Um, they, they, the Grange, Grange called it, they, they, were, they were running a store uh, in each community, but basically only for its members. And they projected all kinds of savings on things like corn, flour, supplies, but that uh, the, 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 the merchants began to fight back with secret discounts. Uh, somebody might go into a general store and say, well, Joe, I can get um, some flour from, through the Grange for 50 cents. And the merchant would say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll let you have it for 45, but don't tell anybody about it. You know, so that was going on. So, you know, I was trying to undermine this new new economic force that was uh, right there in, in the midst of the community. Um, but uh, the Grange also had a lot of problems. People would say, yeah, 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 that's a good price. I want, I'll order a barrel of flour. And when the barrel of flour arrived, they didn't have the money to pay for it. Well, you know, the supplier wants to get paid, and so the Grange is in the middle. And uh, that almost brought the Grange movement in Vermont to its knees by 1886. There was all this, this money and, and um, uh, f uh, promises made and, and failure to perform and all of these issues. Um, it, 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 was, it was a, as a business enterprise, it was a failure, really, and the Grange was burned. 
So during that period, after the initial spurt, nothing much happened for the Grange movement because it kind of got a bad name from this, this uh, buying uh, business fiasco. Uh, so from, from 1880, well, around 1880 up to 1889, there were no new Grange units established. And it got down to about a thousand members uh, in 1889. So it was it was pretty pretty weak, uh, and it didn't look good at all. But beginning about 1894, with new leadership and a fresh focus, more on the social and a little bit on the political, but kind of getting out of this co-op buying business. Uh, so in the second half of the uh, 1890s. Uh, 51 new subordinate granges formed, and from 1900 to 1910, 170 were formed. And the membership shot up to, uh, to uh, 7,000 by 1910, and by 1920, the membership in the Grange was 19,000. And it was similar in New Hampshire, really the 1890s and the turn of the 20th century, the numbers shot up and at the peak in New Hampshire. They got up to 320 subordinate granges and over 30,000 members, which if you put it against the population of the state, about one in every 11 persons in the state of New Hampshire was a member of the Grange at the peak. And so it became a real potent political power in a lot of districts. You couldn't get elected unless you were a member of the Grange. Uh, so it was a pretty potent organization. Not quite so much in Vermont, but certainly uh, influential in numerous ways. Um, uh, the uh, uh, railroad battles in Vermont were very, very interesting. Uh, the, the farmers were convinced they were getting gouged by the railroads operating in Vermont. There was the Delaware and Hudson and the Rutland Railroad and the Boston, Man, uh, Rail, Boston Maine and uh, Connecticut Valley. They were, all, they were all evil in the eyes of the farmers. So in a notorious case of the central Vermont suing its competitor, the Boston and Albany, the court gave a cease and desist order uh, and ordered a restructuring of short haul rates and the Grange was right in the middle of it. And it brought national attention, uh, but uh, the railroad owned the Vermont legislature absolutely owned the Vermont legislature, so reform legislation didn't go anywhere. Uh, and the same happened in New Hampshire. And they used to say, in, at the beginning of the 20th century, New Hampshire was a state within a railroad. All right? In other words, the Boston Main Railroad. And you know how they did it? It was very interesting. I'm sure they did the same thing in, New Hampshire, in Vermont, but I haven't really proved it. Was they gave free passes to like the selectmen in towns where the railroad owned property. Or there might be legislation proposed that would be adverse to the interests of the Boston Main Railroad. They had those votes all tied up because they had given free passes to the politicians. Now these free passes were extremely valuable because you could take your entire family and travel on any railroad in the United States free. So just imagine, you know, we could get a pass to go on JetBlue anywhere we wanted any time. We, that, somebody told us how to vote, you know, we might vote their way, you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so anyway, uh, the, the Grange uh, saw uh, in just about every state the fact that uh, farmers had a real hard time getting insurance. Because agriculture, insurance companies always hate agriculture because the risks are so complicated. You know, you have weather risk, you have market risk, bugs, labor, all kinds of issues, and some of them you just can't insure for. So Grange in Vermont formed an insurance company, uh, uh, an in-state insurance company. It succeeded on property insurance, but uh, trying to get life insurance and disability coverage, they couldn't get that off the ground. There's still a legacy Grange insurance company in New Hampshire. It's based down in Keene, but they insure anybody um, called the National Grange Mutual Insurance Company. But uh, in Vermont, uh, here we're getting back to the influence of women, the profound uh, concern for education of children. 
concerned what they call the common schools, the one-room schools that were all over the place. How many did Bridgewater have? Anybody know? How many one-room schools do you have? Does anybody know? Uh, Eleven. There you go. See, you know, like I found towns where they had 23. You know, how, why were there so many? Well, it's obvious. How far could a little second grade girl be reasonably expected to walk? And so you put a school here, and a school here, and a school here. Uh, it was amazing how they proliferated, and um, it, it's a, a fascinating story. You know, most of the, the average age of teachers is 19 years old. Very common for a girl to finish the eighth grade and succeed in school and be hired as a teacher at age 15 to be a teacher in a one-room school. That happened all over the place. Found one in a, in a town history where this poor girl, she, was, uh, she had a room full of kids, and including some boys who were 16 years old, and when she told them to do this or that, they'd grab her and throw her out the window. You know, just a, a day on the job. Um, so uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the pressure to, to do better by the children, it would lead, uh, uh, one, one very noteworthy thing was leading to the creation of the position of school superintendent. School superintendents were created to ride between one-room schools to help these young teachers succeed, develop their lessons, uh, uh, improve their their teaching methods and so on. Um, and now, of course, the superintendents of school, the most powerful figure in many towns. You know, they got all kinds of influence and a big responsibility. Um, but, but in Vermont, the Grange got into a hell of a fight with the University of Vermont. And the Grange was absolutely right, but they never quite beat them, but they came damn close. What had happened was, with the passage of the Morrill Act in 1862 and some subsequent legislation, gave funds to each state for the study of agriculture and the mechanic arts. And money came from Washington uh, to each state. And that's where we got the land-grant colleges now, the great universities all over the country. And in Vermont, the University of Vermont just grabbed the money and didn't spend a nickel on agriculture. They didn't even have a course in agriculture. They never graduated anybody in agriculture for, for the latter half of the 19th century and into the 20th century. And the grains, and they, they, had a, they called it a farm, and it was a joke. They didn't, didn't grow anything there, but they called it a farm. Um, but uh, so the, the grains said, this is wrong, this is terrible. And they sued the trustees of the University of Vermont, said, demanding that something be done, that uh, professors be hired, and that uh, a curriculum be developed to train farmers and, and do research. Uh, oh, my God. And the, the trustees fought back and went to the legislature. And the, uh, the Grange advocated for just a wholesale dismissal of the board of trustees of the University of Vermont and uh, boot them all out and start fresh. Well, it was too much for the legislature to go quite that far, but it sure taught a lesson to the, uh, to the uh, trustees and the hierarchy up in Burlington and slowly along the agricultural education dimension of the University of Vermont uh, came, came going, came into being. The Carnegie Foundation did a study in 1912 and was still critical and it confirmed the rightness of the Grange and its, and its efforts going back to the 1890s. Uh, <laughs> the Grange helped raise the money for the agricultural building at the campus, now called Morrill Hall. Just about every land-grant college in the United States has a Morrill Hall, but they got theirs. The Grangers also were active in getting fairs going, and that was deemed a big deal, you know, a thing, a good, a good public thing to do is to sponsor a fair. And, you know, little towns put on a fair. One day, maybe two, uh, maybe have a regional fair that would take in a county or even bigger. And um, Grange was right in the forefront of that all the way along. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to brag that the first agricultural fair in North America was held in New Hampshire in 1722. There were a bunch of Scotsmen down in a town called Nutfield, it's now called Londonderry, 
And they had, you know, they came from, from the British Isles where fairs had been in existence since medieval times. They petitioned the governor of New Hampshire for permission to hold a fair. And the governor said, yeah, all right, uh, but you've got to have two, one in May and one in October. Uh, pretty, you know, what the heck are you going to do with a fair in May around here? Not much. But anyway, that's what the governor ordained. And he also said there'll be a weekly market. And I, I can argue, I think, successfully, it was the first farmer's market in North America. It happened in Nutfield. Well, anyway, that fair flourished uh, down through the years with all kinds of great activities and drew huge crowds. Uh, but as time went on, uh, it became scandalous behaviors, uh, particularly of flim flam. You know, that's a wonderful term. You know, it's activities that separate people from their money right on the border of illegal, you know, flim flam, getting, taking people's money. Such that by 1850, the legislature revoked that charter and ordained that the fair at Londonderry shall disappear in ignoble oblivion. Anyway, but other fairs flourished. Um, well, here in, in, in Bridgewater, it's so interesting, there's the first subordinate grange in Vermont to build its own grange hall. I mean, where you're sitting today, I mean, this is a historic building. This is, this is incredible. 120-something years ago, they got together, and it's a pretty ambitious building. Some of the Grange Halls are not much more than hovels, and a lot of Grangers, they never could get it together to build a Grange Hall. They might meet in somebody's parlor or in the back of a store or wherever. But this, this is pretty impressive, I have to tell you. Um, those early Grangers, Grangers, they were pretty stern people. No dancing. Even Oliver Hudson Kelly had to cool it. Uh, he asked that lady to dance, and he brought a program from the majority of the people in attendance. But uh, <laughs> anyway, they had a lot of problems. And this, because of no dancing and other kinds of fun, didn't have much appeal for kids. So young people didn't flock to join the Grange. I was in the Junior Grange when I was a, a kid for a couple of years. We had one in Plainfield. And uh, all I can remember about it was we spent an awful lot of time putting tacks in people's chairs. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway. Uh, but uh, uh, from, from, from the hierarchy at the state level uh, came down word early on that each subordinate grange, when it has a meeting, should select a topic for discussion. It needs to be people talking about uh, important issues. And I love some of them. Uh, 1870s, some of the topics that were proposed from the state grange for the subordinates to take up. How much of a man's business should a wife know? How about that one? How about what is the, uh, what, uh, assess the merits of shallow versus deep setting of milk? Well, that's before the milk separator, when milk to get the cream was set. And then the big pans looked like great big sat pans and they put all that milk out there, you know, and put out warm milk in the morning. By one o'clock you can skim off some cream and then you leave it there. Overnight there's more cream to take off along, I'm sure, with plenty of flies and who knows what else. But uh, that, you know, we can debate that. Uh, should we have a deep uh, batch of milk or should it be real th th shallow? Uh, that's, a, that's a topic for discussion. What's the uh, best ration for a dairy cow? Uh, uh, is $2,000 of more value to a young man than a college education? That, that, that has relevance today. I don't know. I, you know. Teenagers around where I am, they'd rather have a big pickup truck than go to college. Uh, my God, the University of New Hampshire now is 59% female. And it's growing all the time. You know, what are we going to do, guys? We got, jeez, I don't know. Talk about veterinary schools. That's that is where it's really shocking. Eighty percent of the candidates for veterinary degrees today are women. And you know, farm boys that used to be the core of the veterinary profession, they can't they can't get four O averages. You know, they just can't compete with the girls. And the girls are so smart and so far ahead of us. Eighteen ninety, some of the topics. How about, well, they talk generally about women's rights and women's suffrage, good topics. P 
prohibition or license sales? What do you think? Should we let them have the alcohol but uh, regulate it closely or should we have all out total prohibition? Good debate. Um, rural free delivery, and this the grains prevailed nationally and state by state in the early 20th century. A wonderful, wonderful advance, but it was kind of controversial in the 1890s. It was going to cost money. Um, should that be? Should we be doing that? Well, if you didn't live on an RFD, how many how many lived on an RFD in their life? Oh, not much. Well, RFD was a post office on wheels. Came to your door six days a week in a rural area. I mean, it was a huge breakthrough. You could buy stamps, ship a package. Your mail came six days a week. It facilitated the rise of daily newspapers getting, like the Rutland Herald, getting to people out in the boondocks. You know, a great advance. And, uh, you know, they brought, they bring a box of baby chicks or a box of honeybees. They still do it. My father was a beekeeper and he used to get packages of bees from Georgia. And, oh, did my mother hate bees. And she hated honey, anything to do with honey. My father always wanted to take it off, take off honey. Good day to take, take off honey. And before, you know, the kids had it trapped on their feet. It was going all over the house. Oh, my God. Um, and then they got into heavier subjects like direct election of United States senators. You realize until 1909, the legislature in New Hampshire and Vermont picked United States senators. And imagine the politics around that. Um, and they said, that's not fair. And uh, uh, then also, a great reform was the idea of primaries. Up to that point, most elections were basically set by uh, groups of men in smoke-filled rooms uh, at caucuses where they would pick, you know, who are we going to have uh, stand for election in Windsor County? And some guys up in Montpelier would say, this guy and that guy and that guy. That's who it's going to be on the ticket. Republican and Democrat. Well, it was always Republicans that won. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Grange said, that's not fair. We don't have any voice. We need to have a primary system. And sure enough, that's where we ended up finally. Both New Hampshire and Vermont uh, adopted. In New Hampshire, a Granger named Stephen Fowler, he was a chicken farmer from down Cheshire County, he led the march. And uh, uh, and it eventually led to the New Hampshire presidential primary in 1916. And Stephen Fowler's desk is now in the Secretary of State's office. And when all these candidates are going to be coming in, I can't even remember their names. There's so many of them. They come in and sign up on Stephen Fowler's desk to be in the presidential primary. 1920s topics. Well, I got into the subject of dehorning of cattle at that time was a pretty grisly undertaking and uh, uh, a lot of people said it's not good and uh, we do it a little more humanely today but it's still controversial some people think it's cruel um, what shall we do with our girls uh, I don't know how would what? <laughs> I don't know anyway state police There's another thing they talked about we need a state police force and that idea, that was a Grange idea, because what was happening post-World War I was the coming of the motor car enabled criminal elements from urban areas like Rutland or Burlington or Manchester. They could drive out in the countryside and plunder, you know, burglarize, rob, whatever, and scoot back and couldn't be caught. You got away. And the little towns were defenseless. And I said, well, I have a state police force to defend rural areas. That was the reason for having uh, a state police. And it took a while, both states, 1930s, finally took hold uh, to have a state police force. And I'm sure the, the, those uh, people that uh, advocated for that would be very surprised to know that the state police are out there with radar guns rather than catching the criminals, but who knows. Uh, anyway, so the, in the office of the Grange, uh, in the office of hierarchy, the, there's the position of the lecturer. And it's the lecturer's job to have a program plan for each meeting. So that's to say, well, call up somebody, will you please play the piano at the Grange meeting? And uh, what do you want us to play? Well, play some waltzes or, you know, all of that. That's the lecturer's job. And, uh, but uh, it begins to fade. Uh, in the 1950s. Uh, all this energy and all this membership uh, begins to shrink and it would shrink 
uh, dramatically. Um, in the decade of the 1950s, 23 Granges went uh, out of business. Um, it had lost 845 members, and then it accelerated in the 60s and 70s. And uh, you know, there's people say, well, why did that happen? What happened? You know. And I, well, you know, lifestyles changed and, and all kinds of things changed in, in, in rural life. But I will argue the biggest disruptor in my lifetime of rural life is television. Absolute disruptor. In Plainfield, New Hampshire, a little village, Plainfield Plain, it's called. There was a general store there run by Tracy Spaulding. And Tracy, uh, he liked to sit up back and smoke cheap cigars and pontificate, and his wife and daughters did all the work, okay? Well, in 1953, there was no television around here. Nothing came in, nothing. And Tracy got a franchise to sell General Electric television sets. And one day a box truck came and had unloaded a whole bunch of television sets. And remember, they were big, and big cartons like this, and they had them in the aisles between the grocery shelves. Everybody said, Tracy's lost his mind. What the hell is he doing? This is crazy. And he took one out of the box and put it up on top of a little meat case, plugged it in, and all it did was go like that. And what the heck is going on? Well, April 1954, Channel 3 Burlington and Channel 8 Mount Washington went on the air. And in two weeks' time, people were lining up to buy Tracy's television set. And they weren't cheap, they were 500 bucks. People going over to Windsor, getting a loan. That'd be like $4,000 today. Getting a loan to buy a television. When you get it home, you're only halfway there, remember? Remember those antennas up on the roof? You had to have one of those damn things. But when they got the reception started coming in, everything changed. Everybody started talking about what they saw on television the night before. They hold up watching. You remember Hop Along Cassidy and Jackie Gleason, Playhouse 90, and all these programs. That's all people talked about. And it just shut everything down, you know? Little towns, we all put on one-act plays, you know, for the hell of it, people. You know, comedies, you know, 35 cents admission, raise money for the PTA or, or something or other. And we all would go. The place would be sold out. Um, it all stopped, just, just like you dropped a, a hammer. Um, and, and we stopped. You know, the, the, the worst television program of all was totally corrupt, uh, you may remember. You old-timers, $64,000 question. Remember that? Everybody was talking about it. Oh, did you see that last night? You think he's going to win tonight? Oh, God, blah, 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 blah. No, it was all rigged. It was all fake. You know, and it's terrible. But anyway, that's what television did. And, uh, um, you know, it, it, it's all different. Now we got the kids on these damn computers and, and all that stuff, Ugh, you know, it's just terrible. Go to a restaurant, I don't know, in West Lebanon, sit there, and look around, people there with their families, they're all, the damn kids are all sitting there playing on a damn computer, well, it's terrible. Anyway, so, well, let's see, I probably talked long enough, huh? anybody got some questions they'd like to throw at me? Sure, yes. Um, you understand that there was a, a lot of grieving going on after the Civil mm -hmm. War in the North because of the loss of the soldiers? Is that the primary reason that people want to farm? Couldn't they still farm if they cope with their depression or not? Yeah, but the, the, the economics changed. Because in the first half, the fortunes were being made with wool. The feeding into the Bridgewater Woolen Company and the Hartford Woolen and the mills in Lebanon. There was money, real money. Uh, and, and there were just thousands and thousands of sheep all over these hillsides. But 1837 was like a perfect storm. A depression set in, uh, the, the Erie Canal and the railroads were opening the, uh, the Midwest uh, and competition was coming in. Because you realize there's no agricultural commodity we can produce here in Vermont that somebody can't produce bigger, better, faster somewhere else. And don't try to tell me maple syrup because those birds right up in Quebec, <laughs> they produce 75% of all maple syrup produced in North America. And they've totally industrialized it. Um, but I mean, and so, uh, 1837. And then the Industrial Revolution was coming. And people didn't need heavy woolen garments because they were working indoors. And then the box stove, central heat, didn't need heavy woolen blankets. So you had all these forces, and it just doomed that prosperity. And there was nothing to come along and take its place. 
you know, we tried uh, dairy farming. Uh, that, was, that came about because of the coming of the railroad. We could ship milk to Boston. Uh, and and that, that's been the core of agriculture in Vermont, uh, or in northern New England pretty much uh, ever since. But uh, you, you read the papers today, it also is struggling. It's just not what it was. Uh, so people just saw no future here, uh, and they, they took off. You know, one of the interesting, yes, just was a second. Yeah, sorry, out of the wall, was there a tariff? Tariffs entered into it. There were all kinds of things, and, and, and the, the, there were more. There was a depression set in after 1837, uh, a whole bunch of things. But one interesting manifestation of the grief that we all felt in, in, in rural northern New England uh, post-Civil War was that 1898, a man uh, named Frank Rollins was governor of New Hampshire. And he said, mm. all politicians at that time had to say what they were going to do to repopulate. That was a hot political issue. You know, like today, they're all going to root out waste, fraud, and abuse. They never do, but they, they say they're going to. Um, in, in that time, doing something about getting people back on the land. Where Frank Rollins said, you know, end of July, early August, we have lovely weather. Okay? Let's have a festival. Let's have food and music. And people get people who went away to come back. And you'll see how lovely it is here. And that'll induce them to come back and repopulate the countryside. It didn't happen, but that's where old home days came from. And his idea spread to Maine and Vermont, Massachusetts. And a lot of times, does Bridgewater have an old home days or an old home week? Uh, a lot of these towns around here still do. And it's the same thing. You have at the end of July, early August, and have kind of a community festival. But that was a manifestation of that grieving. Another thing was, uh, I think Vermont did, I mean, New Hampshire did, they published lists of abandoned farms and circulated those lists in Boston and New York. And, you know, 125 acres shed and barn for $105 or 200 acres with house and barn for $400. And people in the down country said, hey, ooh, wow, that's great. That's the beginning of summer, people. You know, the summer people were attracted, the money from urban areas, to come up and buy these properties. I still run into people who, you know, over, particularly over around Winnipesaukee. They say, oh, you know, I never knew. My great-great-grandfather bought our place for $600 in 1896, and we wouldn't take 900000 for it today. But that was the times. Now, your question? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I went on too long. Uh, yes. uh, I do have a question now about the... Um the rituals of yeah. the um, okay. Grange. How, yeah. how much a part of that was uh, the Grange? I mean, did that? Did they really do all those rituals? Well, yes, they have. Well, somebody who is any Grange members here, make sure I get it right. This lady right here can tell you chapter and verse. But it was very, very important, and uh, they, the, the the hierarchy wanted everybody to memorize their parts. You know, the master. <laughs> yes, yes. See, the master ran the meeting. It was the president. And then there were these other offices, uh, officers seated around in a square, and they each had a function, and they had parts that they did. You know, the master might say, where the gatekeeper is the gate closed. And the gatekeeper comes to attention and says, where the master, the gate is closed. You know, and, and so on, like that. And so each had a, had a piece in the ritual. And the ones that were good, they memorized it. And then I've been to some Grange meetings that were open, and I saw them standing there with a book, and they were reading. But that, that's frowned upon, right? See, yeah, good. All right, yes, OK, that gentleman, then over here. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you know how many Granges in Vermont are currently active with the membership is, and I'd love to know what the membership of this Grange is. OK, somebody from Bridgewater got the answer? We're right there, there we are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this in my mind about <clears throat> some saves. <clears throat> Pardon me for having a voice. Um, as of the 30th of June of 2018, Vermont had um, 36 subordinate ranges and 1,102 members with 36 with six support uh, ranges 
That's the pattern everywhere. Uh, you know, uh, I'll take your question just a second. Uh, people often say, well, geez, these Grange halls, how do they get them built? You know, what, what happened? And I always say, chicken pie suppers. Right. Chicken pie suppers. Think what a chicken pie supper would do. You've got chickens on the farm. Some of them, they stop laying off with their heads, and there's meat for the chicken pie. You've got potato, you've got peas, carrots. You've got somebody who knows how to, how to make a good crust and a good gravy. You got a, you got something people won't pay for, and boy, that is an art. What's that? And homemade pies? Oh yeah, I mean it was wonderful. Yes, your question. Yeah, sir. Well, I asked. You all set now, gentlemen, right here. Yes, you had a question. Oh, who who are out to be masons and who are out to be uh, grange members, or were they both? Yeah. Well, uh, 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 both. bear in mind the masons are a Protestant order. Okay, I mean, very Protestant, uh, and so I, th I think you could you could find Catholics in the Grange, but it, it wasn't as the religious connection wasn't that big. But in I know in Wisconsin, German Catholics would not join the Grange because it was too close to Masonic. The, the Catholics formed their own, uh, the Knights of Columbus. Uh, it was, but it did not, the Grange idea never took hold in the South. Uh, it, it was a Yankee thing and they didn't want anything to do with it. Yes. Uh, one more, down right, right here and I'll come back to you. Yes, go ahead. So I joined the Grange in high school. I was like, what do you mean? Yeah. And what you're talking about, a little thing from that. Number one, the cigar was cut the air because the cigar had missed. Cigarette smoke and handy. Oh my god. And one of them went in, you got a lot of gatekeepers and yellow and there's no way out. You had the two doors. Yes. During World War II, what did they do? And if we were in the service, they put on a supper, they took collection, they had us lined up to thank us for going to the service. Then they had a dance. Sure. Remember, you're going to dance at the great falls. The first Thing I remember hearing anything public 
They had someone come in, play the guitar, the drum, and the bass player, and finally told jokes. That was a big deal. They were on the stage. That was a fiction guy. And then during World War II, different ranchers had a little band. There was a certain one that people just followed that one group. We were playing air grape water. We didn't go over to Mendon. My cousin would have a lot of ladies and take us over there. About four or five, and that's what we go for recreation. We were out in the country. We were we didn't go to Woodstock. We were social group there because we were outsiders. We didn't go to Woodstock as kids until high school. But these are things that brought up. And the reading they had, the subject was what do you have for weeds in your garden? That was the subject. The lecture, of course, probably had. And they went around. Each person would tell their thoughts. And it was very impressive because mm -hmm. the ritual they had, and then of course the social bit. Mm -hmm. Egg salad sandwiches. Mm -hmm. The about. <laughs> yeah, lots of egg salad sandwiches. By golly, now, that's wonderful. That, that, that's I love hearing that. That's, that's terrific. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Does the figure of speech black ball come out of the range one? Well, it comes out of various of those secret orders. Uh, black ball, uh, they vote, and there's one. And there, if you're in favor of a person or uh, some particular activity, you your white ball is yes, and a black ball is no. And in some orders, uh, a one black ball, it could be ten whites. A one black ball, that's a, it's a defeat. I mean, it's a, it's a negative. All it takes is one. So that's where the, the expression black ball comes from. You know, I got one of those bells. Yes. One fellow in South Woodstock told me he was black ball. Yeah. He just died. Yeah. And he told me one story. He said, the cops came in and he was stuck in the mud. Yeah. There was a mud hole by their house. Yeah. So it was the day of the mud, he kept putting water in the mud holes. And people got stuck, he could take them from the mouth. <laughs> and his father said, uh, I want to give you a name, maybe you better stop. <laughs> he told me he got black balls, so he could find a little hill around and hit black balls. <laughs> That's a good one. I love that one. Oh my God. Well, you've had enough, have you? You want me to wrap it up? Okay, well, sure. Thank you folks very much. There's stories we can go on all day and all night. I know they're wonderful stories, but that's rural life, and that, that's what, what all of you really are lucky to be a part of. I mean, I can go into Manchester or Nashua, and, and I talk about this, and I just get blank stares. I mean, you folks, you understand rural life, how, how interesting it is, and, and really the interpersonal relationships are so much different than what we are able to live with up here, and, and it's wonderful. Yeah. The thing you didn't mention was the Memorial Day parades that were put on basically by the Grange no. and the uh, veterans. Yes. And uh, um, we just down in Grafton, Vermont, celebrated 145 years wow. marching with the uh, oh, parades with the uh, Grafton yeah. Coronet Man. A Coronet Man. Well, thanks everybody very much. Thank you. Give me a Look. Okay.